Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much for coming out. Uh, we very much appreciate uh, you taking the time to come and uh, uh, participate in one of our uh, and it, one of our centennial lectures. As many of you know, this is our 100th anniversary, the celebration of the centennial of our faculty, uh, and it's great to see so many people, friends, uh, 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 colleagues, uh, alumni, supporters of our faculty. As cold and nasty as it is outside, I feel the warmth inside at this very moment. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Jason Lusk, uh, uh, Jason, Regents Professor uh, at uh, Oklahoma State University, uh, uh, Willard Sparks Endowed Chair, and late breaking news as of today, perhaps even this morning, uh, a fellow of the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association, one of the most august bodies globally uh, within the area of agricultural economics. So a round of applause for that new news as well. You know the title, you have heard about uh, the book. Please join me in welcoming Jason to uh, give his talk. Have fun. Wow, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. You know, in uh, Oklahoma, if we even had a quarter of this much snow, everything would be shut down for about two weeks. So uh, I appreciate you all giving me the opportunity to experience a little bit of winter this winter. Um, I uh, also wanted to say at the onset that it's, it's great to be at the University of Alberta. Uh, for those of you who may not know, you have some really world-class resource and agricultural and food economists here, uh, and I've known many of them for years, so it's great to be here with them and to meet more of you. Also, they're going to answer any of the really hard economics questions at the end. Is that right? This row right, right there in the middle? Okay, great. Appreciate that. Uh, so uh, what I'm most excited about, though, is to talk to you about the future of food and the fight for where that future is heading. Now, I, I suspect, like a lot of you, I have a, a perspective about food and agriculture that is colored by my past. But I, I don't presume that many of you actually know that much about me, so I thought it might help if I just took a couple of minutes and, and showed you a little bit about where I came from and maybe how some of my thoughts about food were formed. So I thought I'd start at the very beginning. This is me, 1974. Um, uh, I was born to be, I think, a Texas Tech Red Raider or Oklahoma State Cowboy because I was born with my guns up. Um, I was uh, raised in two very small towns in West Texas. My family were not farmers, uh, but pretty much everyone else we lived around was. Uh, my dad was one of these guys that, that didn't want his kids sitting around um, the house when it was uh, summertime being idle, so I spent most of my childhood years from you know, the age of about 10 to, to 18, uh, working in neighbors' co corn, soybean, and cotton fields. Uh, like most kids in the rural areas there, I, I raised my fair share of sheep and hogs for 4-H and, and uh, FFA competitions. And uh, I can really uh, remember those times as being sort of distinctive in forming my thoughts about food. In particular, I, I have uh, one memory of standing with a hoe in my hand at the end of a cotton field hot sun beating down on my calloused palms with about a half a mile to go to the end of the row, thinking, this is all the incentive I need to finish college. And um, so that, that's what I did. I, I got a degree in food technology uh, later, a graduate degree in, in agricultural economics. Uh, I worked for some county extension agents who planted some of the first biotech cotton in that part of Texas. I worked for some food processors uh, mainly sweeping floors, but also making uh, salsa and, and uh, salad dressings for some of the largest restaurant chains. And I've spent the last 15 years or so studying the economics of food. And, and the reason I tell you all that is to let you know that I suspect, like a lot of you, I care about food and agriculture. I've spent my lifetime around the people who make the food and, and deliver it to our, our table. And yet it seems that almost everyone that I run across these days is an expert on food. It's, it's kind of hard to pick up the newspaper or turn on the television or get on a plane and talk to somebody uh, without hearing um, some new plan about how to save our food system or some idea of, of uh, what exactly is wrong with our food system and also some new policy that will help save us all. And a lot of this has, has come about from something called a, a food movement. Um, there's a lot of really positive things we can say about this food movement. It, it's encouraged people to think more about where their food comes from. It's encouraged people to use the power of their wallets and sometimes even their own backyards to get the things they want out of the food system. And so I think there's a lot of positive things about 
about this food movement. But I think one of the downsides of this food movement, unfortunately, is that it, it's a movement that started off by promoting and encouraging high quality niche products. But unfortunately, at the same time, it's sometimes taken to denigrating conventional agriculture. And in a lot of cases, creating a lot of fear about our food production system, fear that I don't think is necessarily warranted by the scientific evidence. And it's also a movement that sometimes advocates for policies that I don't think um, are gonna have the kinds of benefits that many people hope they'll have. So I'm gonna spend uh, most of my talk today talking to you a little bit about that food movement, my critique of it, and my alternative vision for a future of food. Now, I, I suspect some of you may disagree with some things I have to say. Um, that's okay, we're all, we're all grown-ups, and that's one of the awesome things of being in an academic environment. We can exchange ideas, even if we don't necessarily agree with each other, we can learn, and we can hopefully uh, reach some, at least, appreciation for where we're coming from. But there is one thing, even if you disagree with me, that I want you to keep in mind, and that is that often we all care about many of the same things. So I, I do a survey of, of 1,000 U.S. consumers every month at Oklahoma State. And this was a question I posed to consumers, over 1,000 U.S. consumers, just uh, two months ago. And I asked them, um, when they're thinking about the future, um, which of those food and agricultural challenges are they most concerned about? And I asked them to rank a set of issues. And you can see that the, the things that come up uh, first are things like having affordable food for my family. Uh, making sure we have food that's healthy, that doesn't cause obesity and diabetes. Producing enough food to meet the demands of a growing world. The next one down is making sure we have food that has uh, lower environmental impacts. Now you might rank those things a little differently, but I think we can all agree those are important things, right? So that's really not what's at, at issue here. And one way I think about this is, is with my own kids. These are my two boys, Jackson and Harrison. This is. Uh, when we lived in Paris, when I was on sabbatical there a couple of years ago. This is, uh, this is at a baseball game last summer. And so I care about their future. I want them to have clean air, clean water. I don't want them paying too much for food. We all care about our children and get grandchildren. So that's really not what's, issue, what's, what's at issue here. Uh, really, the, the, the question isn't whether we want good things in the future. The harder question is how do we get them? And I think there are different ways and different alternatives for reaching those things that we all want. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So let me start by giving you a little bit of a sense of the context in which I think people working in food and agriculture, and I suspect many of you are either students or faculty or staff in a, in a, in a, a college of agriculture. And, and what is the, the sort of prevailing culture with regard to food, the sort of thinking about food and agriculture? And I'm going to give you several examples to, to sort of let you know the tenor of this debate. The first one is uh, from this book, Food Fight, by Kelly Brownell. He's a professor at Duke University. Uh, in his book, Food Fight, he said that we all live in a toxic food environment. Um, Dr. Brownell was one of the first people more than 20 years ago to advocate for what he called at the time a Twinkie tax. Um, you know, people said that was crazy at the time, but I think it's important to realize that ideas matter. And indeed, today, we can see one of the things that's on the policy table are fat taxes, soda taxes. So ideas matter, and they do come to fruition. One of the most influential books in this genre, of course, is Michael Pollan's uh, Omnivore's Dilemma, written uh, now almost 15 years ago. Uh, you don't even get two pages into this book until you learn, or he tells us, that Americans, and I assume he might lump Canadians into that group too, have a national eating disorder. Very serious words for people that see their job as helping to produce the food that's feeding the nation. I think a lot of people underestimate the power of this book. Some people have got onto me and said, well, Jason, these are just a little, some fringe ideas. But I dare say you can, you can probably walk on, on a, almost any major college campus uh, in the U.S. and Canada today and find a course that re requires this book as reading. I'd be shocked if there wasn't a class at the University of Alberta that didn't require this book as reading. So this is an important book in the sense of influencing people's and students' ideas about our food system and where it's heading. We also have people like Mark Bittman. He has a column in the New York Times. He's a, a cookbook author, and he's written several other books. He gave a TED talk that's been downloaded over three million times, and in that talk, he showed a picture of a cow and then an atomic bomb exploding, and he said that our modern agricultural production system is leading to a holocaust of a different kind. So these are not French people. These are people that get millions of uh, views on YouTube who write best-selling books, and we also have celebrities 
like uh, Pamela Anderson. This is an ad I, I took off of PETA's website, and you can see she's got herself uh, sort of carved up there like a side of beef, and the ad says, all animals have the same parts. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a sow with silicone breast implants, but uh, I think you get the point she's trying to get across, and she's wanting people to join her movement, which is to uh, stop eating meat, stop cruelty, and go one step further, not even eat meat. So for you know, a place like Alberta that has a lot of uh, livestock production, it's a you know, very serious critique of, of a major uh, agricultural industry. I think a lot of these views are summarized pretty well in an editorial that James McWilliams, a historian, wrote for the New York Times a couple years ago. He said that the industrial production of animal products is nasty business. From mad cow, E. coli, and salmonella, to soil erosion, manure runoff, and pink slime, factory farming is the epitome of a broken system. And it's not just a view about livestock agriculture. So for example, another best-selling book, uh, Salt, Sugar, Fat, and, you know, in that book he said that food companies use these ingredients as weapons. And, it, and that we should think about policies that hold food companies accountable for their weapons and for the costs that keep climbing. So if you spend your time, as I have, reading a lot of the popular writings about food and agriculture, the sort of image that you come away with is that something's really broken. That as consumers, we're eating too much sugar, too much salt, too much meat, too much processed food, too many pesticides, we're too fat, and we're spending too much on healthcare. And the image you get is the one that I took out of Time magazine of Ronald McDonald. He's eating everything he wants to, but he just can't quite keep up. And again, it's a view that's, that's espoused in many popular books, some of which I've already mentioned, but there are many, many others, like Pandora's Lunchbox, Seeds of Deception, and uh, my favorite, Farmageddon. It's not just a view about the consumers, but about production agriculture itself. It's a view that agriculture is too corporate, it's too monoculture, it's too subsidized, and that ultimately it's not sustainable. And the image that you're sort of left with in your head is this one that I took from a Chipotle video uh, that's been downloaded over, over 12 million times uh, on the internet. And it's just of a soulless, heartless machine that's producing your food. So if these folks don't like our current agricultural production system, what, what do they propose instead as an alternative? And in many ways, I would characterize this as a sort of return to nature a romantic idealism movement. It's a movement, for example, that manifests itself in a call for more local food, more natural food, slow food, unprocessed food. It's a view that looks back at these images, these are other videos, uh, snapshots I took out of videos from the Chipotle ads, it looks back sort of at our past 40 or 50 years ago and says that was sort of an ideal time. Now there's nothing wrong with organic or local food, and there's a lot of positive things we can say about those foods. But the challenge is that many people are not willing or not able to pay what it costs to produce food that way. So the challenge that, that often happens is that many people in the food movement see that, that the market share for organic or, or local food is really small and people aren't eating the way they'd really like them to. And so then what often happens is a call for taxes, subsidies, regulation, and often a whole lot of social pressure. Like somehow you're sort of a, a bad person if you're not buying the local organic asparagus. But the view, I think, that's often espoused there is that if we could, that, that agriculture itself in the 1940s or 50s was somehow the, the ideal, these small family farms, no corporations involved, and if we could just get ourselves back to that time, we'd be better off. This is a picture of actual 1940 agriculture. This is my dad and his siblings on their farm in Silverton, Texas in about 1945. I don't know about you, but those don't look to me like the same images in the Chipotle video. What you can see back there is some really dusty, barren uh, farmland, one scrawny cow out in the distance. And the reality is that this kind of farming that they practiced was not sustainable. And when, they, when new practices came along, when uh, agricultural scientists inv invented new uh, tilling techniques, when we learned more about different ways of growing animals, the farmers in those situations rapidly adopted those because it made their lives easier, it made their soil and their land more productive, it gave them a chance to stay on that farm. My, my father and his siblings don't live on that farm anymore. They went off to college to get jobs uh, in, in town and, el and elsewhere. And so I think the challenge is that as we look back you know, on these, these sorts of times, we, we look back with a lot of romanticism. Oh, wasn't that great? But the reality is those were actually pretty tough times, and they weren't very sustainable times either. One way of thinking about this, I think, is in a quote I found in a book by John Steinbeck 
uh, in Travels with Charlie. He was traveling around America in the 1960s, recording various observations. And one of the things he wrote in this book is that, that he said, even while I protest the assembly line production of our food, our songs, our language, and eventually our souls, I know it was a rare home that baked good bread in the old days. What I like about that quote is that, on the one hand, he, was, he understood the sort of natural human tendency to look back on the past and romanticize the past. But he was also honest enough with himself to know the past sometimes wasn't all that great. The bread sometimes wasn't so fantastic. Uh, if John Steinbeck is too highbrow for you, maybe we can, uh, I can show you a cartoon. Uh, here are two cavemen, maybe uh, 10,000 years ago, sitting in a cave. One's looking at the other, and he says, you know, something's just not right. Air's clean, water's pure, we get plenty of exercise, and everything we eat is organic and free range. And yet nobody lives past 30. And yet we tend to think back to those times and think, wasn't that awesome? I mean, we even have paleo diets, right? Now, now if we could just eat like those people, we'd be, we'd be better off. But again, I think that's just sort of foolish romanticism. It's a view of the past that does not uh, comport with the actual reality of the past. And so I think as a result that a lot of people have views about food and agriculture that are somewhat distorted. So today, at least uh, in the US, I don't know what the statistics are in Canada, but somewhere uh, less than, than 2%, maybe around 1% of, of people uh, work in production agriculture. In many ways, that's a great thing. You know, we, as, as people involved in production agriculture, have become so productive People can do other things in life and not have to worry about where their food came from. But one of the downsides of that is that people often don't have the connection with that real world farmer to check the things they read on the internet, to see if the things they're reading uh, correspond with the th way the things are actually on the ground. And so as a, sometimes as a consequence, we believe all kinds of things, or we exaggerate things, or things become much more fearful than the evidence would seem to suggest. And I think this really hit home to me on my own campus at Oklahoma State University. I gave a talk to the instructors of our freshman English composition course, and I talked to them. They asked me to talk to them about writing. And so I gave a little five-minute talk about that. And after I finished, one of the people asked me, have you seen uh, Food, Inc., this documentary that's fairly, very critical of, of our current agricultural production system? And I said, yes. And then they told me that they actually require all of our uh, freshman students in, in English writing to watch this video. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, and then for the next 45 minutes, I engaged in a really lively conversation about the state of food and agriculture. And what was really striking to me was the view among many of my colleagues that they were being poisoned and fattened by an out of control food system, that farmers were raping their land, that they were poisoning consumers. And I, the thing that was surprising to me about this was all they had to do to see large scale production agriculture was look out their window on their drive home. You know, this is not Berkeley, California, or New York City. This was Stillwater, Oklahoma, population 40,000. And that's when it really hit home to me that even on our campus, small campus of agriculture, people were forming views about food and agriculture without sometimes just turning around and talking to the person next to them in the checkout line at Walmart, who probably was a farmer, maybe, maybe even a, a chemical salesman from Monsanto. But those people had become evil because they did not have a connection with those people to talk to them. So let me just give you a few examples of the kinds of things I think that people get fearful, that people are fearful of, and then contrast that with what we know, at least from the scientific research. Let's talk for just a second about food pesticides. Consumers are often worried about pesticide use in agriculture, um, but why do farmers use pesticides? Well, if they can keep the bugs off, they can produce more food, they can sell more and make a little more money. As consumers, you may not realize it, but you also like food pesticides too. Why? It makes your food less expensive. And also, the next time you walk in a grocery store, if you see two apples and one of them has a, a bug a hole eaten out of it, I bet you won't pick it up, will you? So if you pick that cleaner apple that is not eaten, you're picking one that probably was provided to you by pesticides. Okay, so it's not irrational to be fearful of pesticides, but what we want to do is ask how dangerous are they in the grand scheme of things? So one study calculated that there might be an extra 20 deaths that occur in the United States each year due to food pesticides. Now, 20 deaths are, are a tragedy, but how risky is that relative to the other risks in life? Well, if you look at the data from the CDC, you find that about 300 people die each year from drowning in the bathtub. So you're about 15 times more likely to die from drowning in a bathtub than you are from food pesticides. You're about 1,500 times more likely to die from a car accident in a year than you are food pesticides. Getting in that car today is far more riskier 
to you than eating food pesticides are. Another way to sort of think about this is that eating fruit and vegetables is far more healthy to you than it is dangerous to eat food pesticides. You're going to save a lot more lives by getting people to eat more fruits and vegetables that are sprayed with food pesticides. One of the things that happens in this sort of uh, romanticism about nature and the past is that we, we tend to think anything that came from nature is good and wholesome. Anything made by man is bad and should be further scrutinized. So as a consequence, we often forget the fact that plants often produce their own pesticides. So this was a study in the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences. They calculated that of all the pesticides that we eat, about 99.9% .9 of those are naturally occurring. Why would a plant naturally make pesticides? It doesn't want to get eaten by bugs either. So over time, Mother Nature has allowed these plants to produce chemicals and compounds that protect themselves from bugs, insects, and other various diseases. Uh, and, and again, because of the sort of, uh, you know, uh, the sort of fascination with naturalism, we, seem, we seem to forget that a lot of those natural pesticides are often far more toxic to us than the chemical ones we spray on them. They're all chemicals, I should say, the synthetic ones that we spray on them. So for example, here's another chart that came out of, out of a study that, that showed the relative uh, cancer risks from the compounds that occur naturally in coffee versus lettuce, orange juice, so forth and so on, compared to, for example, here's a, a, down here is DDT, a pesticide that was banned. These natural uh, pesticides that we eat all the time are far more deadly to us than are some of the synthetic ones we make. Now, I'm not arguing here pesticides should not be regulated. I'm not arguing we should not do safety evaluations of them. Uh, but what I am saying is that we want, we want to put our fears in perspective. We want to look at the actual evidence. Let me give you another example. Um, almost all the cattle and feedlots in the US and in Canada are given a growth promotants. Often it's a form of estrogen. Uh, why would they do this? Because it increases the growth of animals. Uh, animals put on more weight, more food for you, using in less time, using less resources for the farmer. There's a lot of concern about these hormones. So you know, a common thing I hear will, is, uh, you know, isn't this to blame for the lowering age of puberty among girls, all these hormones we're, we're putting in our meat? But the research suggests that that is unlikely to be the cause. If anything, it's probably because we have a lot more calories available to us now. Uh, one way of looking at the, again, the relative risks that are involved here is to look at a study that calculated that if you eat a hamburger that came from an animal that received a hormone implant versus one that didn't, you're eating about three extra nanograms of estrogen. How big is a nanogram? It's a billionth of a gram. But you still might be asking, is three nanograms big or small amount? Well, the way I'd say it is if you're worried about those three nanograms, you ought to be really worried about soybeans, because the equivalent amount of soybeans would have almost a million nanograms of estrogen. A head of cabbage would have about 10,000 nanograms, and that birth control pill that um, sits in many people's uh, medicine cabinets at home has many thousands of times the estrogen as, as what you would get in, in a typical hamburger. So again, I'm not saying we shouldn't study these things, that we shouldn't uh, look into them to understand the safety, but what I am saying is we gotta, we gotta put the risks in perspective. One last example here, and that's on a biotechnology. A lot of people are really worried about GMOs, genetically engineered food. Uh, and so, for example, here's a survey I did just last month. Um, I asked people, uh, do you think we should require mandatory labeling of foods produced with genetic engineering? Like 80% of people say yes. So pe this is a technology people are very fearful of. But I wonder really how deep that fear is and how founded that knowledge is. Uh, on that same survey, I also asked people, uh, do you support or oppose a policy of mandatory labels on foods that contain DNA? You can see also 80% of people said they would support that. Uh, if you don't know, you have DNA, I have DNA, all living plants, animals have, have DNA. So I'm not sure how seriously we should take some of the things that people say on surveys. I say this as a guy who does surveys uh, for, for uh, some parts of my research. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it does show the suspicion people have about messing with nature and with DNA. But I think the important thing is, is what, what does the science say about the, the relative risks of, of these genetically engineered um, crops that we have on the market? And if you look at any of our major scientific authorities on the subject, whether um, it's the uh, National Academy of Sciences, American Medical Association, um, you just you know, try to think of yourself of what would I consider to be a, a, a important and unbiased, neutral scientific authority, and almost all of those have come out and said that eating 
foods produced with biotechnology is no riskier than eating foods that were, were, came from crops using traditional plant breeding methods. So again, I think there's, again, another case where people's fears often are far uh, out of line with what the actual evidence shows. Now, one of the things that also people have sort of misperceptions about or that people take for granted, I think, is the, are the prices that we pay for food. Um, so just to give you a, a general sense in which many people in the food movement view this issue, I just put some quotes up here, I'm not going to read them all, but there's a very common view, even one that was espoused just a few months ago, that somehow food is too cheap. It's too inexpensive. But I think here's another example where sometimes the beliefs that people have about food does not correspond very well with the reality on the ground. Here's a, price, uh, a graph of, of food prices, world food prices, put out by the UN Food and Agricultural Organization going back to the 1990s. And you can see that when a lot of the, those popular books were written, Fast Food Nation and Omnivore's Dilemma, yeah, food prices were sort of historically at a, at a relatively low level. But look what happened in 2011, again in, a, in 2007 and 2008, and again in 2011, is that food prices around the world rose to some of their highest levels we've ever witnessed. There's a, lot of, uh, a couple of good pieces of research that I've seen recently that suggest that these food price spikes, not only did they cause problems, I think, for people, but they also caused or were to, to blame for a lot of the civil unrest that we saw in many parts of the world, especially in, in the Middle East. And so when I look at this graph, one of the things I think to myself is, who is it that is most affected by these price spikes? It's probably not you and I in this room, but it's often some of the people in some of the most impoverished places in the world. Indeed, uh, if you look at data from the, the UN, they calculate that just under a billion people in the world go hungry each day. They either don't have enough access to food, or they don't have enough money or resources to acquire the food that they want to eat. So we often think about these things as a problem of the developing world. But it's kind of shocking, actually, if you look at statistics even in our own backyard. Uh, I don't know what the numbers are in Canada. I would suspect they're probably similar to what we have in the States. This is the percentage of U.S. households that are food insecure. So today it's about 15% of U.S. households that rose up during the recession and it stayed at that level. So that 15% of households are food insecure, that means about 50 million Americans have a hard time affording enough food to eat. It's kind of incredible, isn't it? So when I think about this idea that somehow we should get people to pay more for food, I think to this sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I don't know about y'all, but when I was a kid in 4-H, I had to learn this. And the idea behind this Maslow's hierarchy of needs is you kind of start down at the bottom, and you've got to meet all your physiological needs, like uh, am I getting enough food to eat? Do I have a shelter over my head? And once you meet those needs, then you can move up and worry about things like uh, am I safe? Then you can worry about things like do people love, you know, am I, am I surrounded by people love, that love me? Am I esteemed? Do you like my talk? You know, those kind of things we can worry about once we've met those things in the bottom of the triangle. But I think if I had to be very critical of at least some of the perspectives on the food movement, they've taken this sort of triangle and turned it on its head. They seem to want people to reach inner fulfillment and self-actualization through their food choices. But how can we expect people do, to do that when they're just plain hungry? If I wanted to be kind of snarky about it, I'd say that sometimes there's a view in which you know, somebody living in uh, you know, inner city, uh, Toronto or New York or Detroit, that their biggest problem in life is really just finding local organic squash. You know, I think that's sort of mistaking our own particular preferences, our own particular desires with somebody that has an entirely different set of priorities in their own, in their own life. Okay, so what I want to do in just the next few minutes, and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap up, is, is turn to a very specific issue. So I've been talking sort of in generalities here, so I think it's important to look at a very specific alternative that's being proposed uh, to this food movement. And I think it's important because if I had to be fair to those people that were saying food prices were too low, they weren't just you know, being mean, saying everybody should just pay more for food. Their argument is, is actually more subtle than that. Their argument is that there are all these externalities, all these external costs in food. So the, the low food prices are really just a mirage. They're masking all these other costs that we have to pay uh, in society for environment, you know, degraded environmental outcomes or, or health consequences. So if I was fair to them, that's really the essence of their argument. Okay, but then we also have to evaluate their proposed solution on their same terms. Okay, so if the idea is that we should have a more local food system, what we need to ask is whether that local food system can solve all those externality problems they're talking about. Are local foods good for the environment? Are local foods good for the economy? 
Are local foods better for your health? And I think you're going to find out shortly my answer to those things is going to be no. But I do this, I, I want you to understand my position here is a little bit of a nuanced one, okay? I'm not against local foods. I'm against bad arguments for buying local foods, okay? This is again a picture of my dad, my granddad on their farm. You know, they had pigs in their backyard. They had chickens in their backyards. I know what local food is. I've got a garden in my backyard. I don't dislike local foods. I think they're great. And I think, I think they're great for probably a lot of the reasons many of you think they're great. And that's because they're often a little tastier. It's kind of fun. It's something to do. It's important, I think, for me to teach my kids a little bit about how food grows and where it comes from. And sometimes there's some pleasure out of meeting the person, the farmer, who, who supplies that food. Those are all good and righteous things. But here's my argument. Those are all private pleasures you get from personally participating in that local food system. And I'm not going to take any issue with that. But what I am going to take issue with is that somehow we should promote policies that subsidize local foods, that require local schools or hospitals, as Michael Pollan has proposed, to buy a certain percentage of their food within a given radius. That people that are on food assistance, like food stamps, should receive further subsidies when the things they buy also happen to be local. It's those kinds of policies that I'm going to take issue with, that somehow you should subsidize my purchase of local asparagus. And I'm also going to take a little bit of issue with the sort of uh, you know, moralizing of local food that somehow you're a bad person if you're also not supporting this particular local food movement. Okay, But I'm not at all arguing that you shouldn't buy local food. And indeed, if I was running a restaurant, I might even source local food because I know that people will think it's a little tastier, and sometimes it might actually be. So that's really not what is at issue here. What I'm taking issue with are the policies that people are, are advocating in this regard. So let's go through it, then I'm going to talk just really briefly on some of those points I mentioned before. It's better for the environment, better for health, um, and it, is it um, um, better for the local economy? So let's start with the environment. And what you often see are you know, graphs like this, I can't remember which uh, publication I took this out of, that calculates the um, carbon footprint of different, different kinds of foods. And the idea that many people have is a very su superficial idea about the local food movement, and that is because the food traveled fewer miles, it therefore used less energy in that transportation, therefore better for the environment. I think the trouble with that particular view is that the amount of miles traveled is only one very small part of the overall environmental impact of getting food to your table. One study calculated that about 80% of the global warming impacts of getting food to your table occur on the farm. What that means to me is that I want to grow the food where it can be most efficiently grown and then ship that food to where we want to eat it. One, one good example of this, I think, is a study that was done a few years ago that looked at the environmental impacts, the energy use in, uh, of, of Londoners eating lamb that was grown around London or lamb that was grown in New Zealand. And the study showed that it was far more efficient for those folks living in London, in terms of energy impacts, to eat that lamb that came from New Zealand than it was the lamb eaten at home. Now, how the heck is it possible that you can use four times less energy uh, by transporting lamb 10,000 miles? Well, the reason is that, all, that uh, New Zealand is just naturally endowed with all those things that make raising sheep easy. Lots of sunshine, lots of grass, lots of land. Moreover, you can put that, that meat on a boat, put it on the sea, and shipping by sea is incredibly energy efficient. Think about it. Christopher Columbus was sailing the ocean blue far before we, we were using uh, fossil fuels, right? You put something on an ocean current, it can be uh, trans, um, transported very energy efficiently. We put things on uh, semis, which are also relatively efficient. You look at big companies like Walmart, they have incredibly efficient distribution systems. A lot of the transportation costs, quite frankly, if the research, if you look at it, is uh, involved in us getting our car to the supermarket. That's often the highest part of the transportation cost in terms of in, uh, energy, energy output. Another way to think about this um, uh, environmental impact is to realize that, uh, to look at some of the studies that looked at what hap actually goes on sometimes at some of the farmers markets. And one of the things that you see in these small scale farmers markets is a lot of the produce, one estimate suggested upwards of 30% of the produce gets thrown away even before the market because it's of unacceptable size or quality, and then because the stuff isn't eaten and everybody else is bringing their same produce that came ripe at the same time to the market, another 20% gets thrown away after the fact. 
that kind of waste often doesn't happen in large scale, scale agricultural production regions because what they'll do is they'll situate processing facilities that make sauces or uh, are able to can these things. And so the level of waste often isn't nearly, nearly as high. So let's move on to another issue that often gets uh, uh, said about local foods, and that is uh, local foods are good for the local economy. So this is a graph I took out of an organization in my own state of Oklahoma that tried to say that, you know, if you spend your mon money locally, less of that money leaves the economy than if you spend money that's not, you know, if you don't support local businesses. Now, one challenge with that particular view is that it kind of vi violates a basic accounting identity. Imports have to equal exports. So there's no such thing as money, if money is continually leaving your economy and not, co not coming back, you're not getting a paycheck. So this whole idea that more money is staying locally really doesn't make a lot of sense because just as a strict accounting identity, imports have to equal exports. But I think the more important way to think about this, and one, a way that's probably a little more intuitive is to think about it in these sort of um, economic multipliers that economists often use. And you know, the idea is that if you spend a, a, a dollar locally, let's say you go to your farmer's market, you spend your dollar there, that farmer's then gonna take that dollar and he's gonna go, let's say, to a local clothing store. And that dollar then gets taken back, somebody eats out at a restaurant, and that restaurant buys, again, that local produce. So it's this dollar making this virtuous cycle. Often the way that this gets couched in economic impact studies is that one dollar spent locally creates X new jobs. Here's my question for you. Where did that dollar come from? Often when economists do economic impact studies, that dollar came from somewhere else. So let's say Nissan or uh, Honda wants to build a new auto plant here in Edmonton. Then in that case, really the dollars are coming from somewhere else. And they really are creating X new jobs. But in the case of local foods, that dollar was already here. It's not a new dollar. So you gotta ask yourself, what would that dollar have been spent on otherwise? So for my economist friends up there, all I'm really saying is that dollar has an opportunity cost. And we wanna ask, uh, what was the best use of that dollar? And it's not always clear to me that the best use of that dollar was spent on local foods. But even if I'm wrong and this in a local food policy could uh, help local producers, I want you to think a little bit about the dynamics here. So let's say Edmonton passes a policy that says all the local hospitals, jails, and schools have to source all their produce within a, let's say, 50-mile radius. So that might initially help the farmers around this area. But what happens when uh, Calgary passes the same policy? What happens uh, you know, when Vancouver passes the same policy? Now your farmers are losing a market that they previously had for their products. So when all these uh, individual communities and towns become inward-looking, I don't think the economic impact is what we think it is. Uh, another way of saying this is just that trade is good. One of the reasons we're so incredibly wealthy today is because we trade with each other. I do what I do well, you do what you do well, and let's trade with each other and we're better off. Indeed, I think we have this idea that somehow we wanna produce what is local and natural to this region. But if you look at this, it's kinda of crazy, uh, actually. I saw this graph uh, a couple of years ago and I was really astounded by it. This is sort of the, what they call the Columbian Exchange. So did you know that there were, uh, these little, these, all these crops uh, came from Europe to the United States after uh, Columbus and the other um, explorers came across? So there was no cattle or sheep or wheat in the Americas until after this. The other way to think about it is going the other way. There was no such thing as Italian tomato sauce or Irish potatoes until after this Colombian exchange. And yet now what we do is we think, oh, okay, let's eat local, natural. Let's, let's, so the people in... Uh, uh, um, Italy should eat their local uh, Italian tomatoes, right? That's just kind of crazy, isn't it? One of the things that made the Italian tomato sauce so awesome is because we were able to trade with each other, right? We brought them things they didn't have before, and as a result, we're both better off. Um, one more point on this, because I think it is important, and people, I, always, I hear it too often, I think, that local foods are, are good for the economy. So if you pay more for local food, yes, it might benefit a local farmer, okay? And that's all fine and good. But if we require people to buy local foods, it's almost equivalent to, to burning dollar bills. So for example, I think about my kids. If I pass a policy that the Stillwater, Oklahoma schools has to source all their foods within a 30 mile radius, do you think my kids care whether their broccoli came from within 50 miles or not? Actually, do you think my kids really wanna eat broccoli? Probably not, they could care less. And so 
I'm not saying we shouldn't think about how to feed our kids healthily, but what I am saying is just simply requiring that we pl uh, plate uh, two fruit, uh, you know, a local fruit or vegetable uh, isn't necessarily helpful. So even if we could increase local food consumption, that doesn't make it an economically efficient thing to do. One way to think about it is it's like handing out T-bone steaks at a PETA convention, right? It wouldn't be a very smart thing to do even if we could, we could get rid of more steaks. Okay, one last point on this local foods thing and I'll start wrapping up. Are local foods healthier? Honestly, I don't know what that has to do with it. You can eat unhealthy local food or you can eat healthy foreign food. One thing doesn't have to have anything to do with the other one. Um, now, I know you might say, well, you know, surely it's the case that freshly picked fruits and vegetables are most nutrient dense when they're, when they're ripe. And that is true. But the other thing you want to realize is that in, in a lot of those, if you go to the grocery store and buy a, a bag of frozen blueberries, those blueberries were quickly frozen right after they were picked, essentially locking in the nutrient content there. Moreover, if you let that, if you're a part of a, let's say a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, what you're going to get is a big box of produce that's going to sit on your counter for weeks, right? All the while that nutrient co content is degrading. Not only is that wasteful, because a lot of times you're not going to use it, I mean, I don't, I don't even know how to cook kale. If you deliver me a, a, a you know, basket full of it, I can guarantee some of it's going to go wasted. Uh, sort of beside the point. But the point I'm making here is that the nutrient content is going to degrade over the lifetime of that product sitting on your shelf. In many cases, you'd be a lot better off not only eating the um, frozen, but also the canned. So when I think back again to my, my children's case, the schools, if we have a fixed budget, it's not at all clear to me that maximizing the student's health is going to be equated with maximizing the percent of food that's local. Indeed, you can probably buy a lot more canned fruits and vegetables, or maybe a better chef or somebody that can prepare those in a way they want it for that budget, as opposed to this, this elaborate production system of trying to secure things locally. The other important thing about health, and I think a lot of the nutritionists will tell you, is that a really important part of a healthy diet is diversity of your diet. If you eat the same thing all the time, you're not getting a rich mixture of vitamins and minerals that you need. And think about what trade does for us. It provides you with an incredible amount of diversity in your diet. I suspect that if you go to a grocery store here in Edmonton today, Despite the snowstorm, you're going to have Vidalia onions from Georgia. You'll probably have sweet corn from places like Iowa or Mexico. You'll have uh, jalapenos, perhaps, probably even cilantro. All those things you get because you're willing to trade with other people. Uh, and that ability to trade with other people allows you to have a more diverse diet and, as a result, a healthier diet. So again, uh, I'm not against local foods. Um, and if you want to go out and, 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 and uh, participate in your farmer's market or participate in community-supported community agriculture, there's a lot of good things about those, and I suggest you do it. But what I am going to do is urge caution in promoting policies that require or subsidize those kinds of activities because I don't see them solving the problems that we all see in our food system. So let me wrap up a little bit on a, a bit of a positive note and share with you a little bit about, about my view on the future of food. So what kind of future are we going to have? And I think they're really, what I'm, going to, what I'm saying here is I'm contrasting what I see as two possible worldviews. There might be others, but there are, I see two predominantly worldviews. One is a worldview that let's solve our food problems by adopting a more natural production system, looking back to our past, getting smaller, doing things slower. The alternative worldview to that is, is a more technologically advanced worldview, using science, innovation, uh, research, to help us solve our world's food problems. Of course, I think you already know by now which side I'm on, but I also want you to let you know that I'm not foolish, and I know it's, a, it's an uphill battle in terms of this worldview. So that same survey I showed you at the very beginning where I asked people, like, what do you see as the world's biggest food problems? Right after I asked that question, I asked people, what do you think is the most effective way at solving those food problems? And you can see, I gave them two options. One was adopt a more technologically, technological or agricultural production system, more innovation, science, research, and crops and food, or adopt a more natural agricultural production system, more local, organic, unprocessed food and crops. So I must say I was a little disheartened to find that you know, three quarters of people were on this side of the fence. I don't think that means people can't be persuaded. And I, if I thought that was true, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. 
Uh, and I think actually people um, maybe just haven't thought about the issue very much. And so I think if we look at all the things, many of the ways in which our food lives are better today, they are better because we use science and technology and innovation. So let me just give you a couple of examples of that. Women today spend 40% less time in food preparation and 80% less time in meal cleanup than they did in the 1960s. If that change doesn't sound good to you, I suggest you go talk to your grandmother. Uh, or look around at a lot of the women that are in this room, and you're able to do this now both because social customs have changed, I think, for the better, but also because uh, a lot of the time-consuming tasks that were required to put food on the table are not required anymore. We have a tendency to look at these kind of pictures and we think, oh man, wasn't that, wasn't that nice back then, that, that kind of lifestyle? But if you just look a little more critically at this picture, look at that food there. Good Lord, how long would it take to make all that? Then you look a little closer and you think to yourself, where's the microwave? Where's the dishwasher? Where's the man? There are lots of things today <laughs> that are a lot better off about our food production system. Now, there are people like Michael Pollan, his most recent book was Cooked, and he argues, you know, people should really get back in the ki kitchen and, and cook more often. I think that's great. There's no reason uh, not to do that, if that's what you want to do. But the reality is that these were not fond times, and I can, uh, my grandmother, who's in her 90s, uh, she would basically work herself to the bone whenever we'd come visit for all the family, because it just took so long. Uh, and why, why do we now have food that's more convenient, it's because we adopted a lot of technological innovations along the way. And we changed some of our social norms. What about what we pay for food? In the US, and I think it's a very similar statistic in Canada, today we spend less than 10% of our disposable income on food. So back in the 1920s and 30s, we were spending almost a quarter of our income on food. Now again, there's a lot of people that are saying today, we want you to spend more on food. But the way I look at this is that if I'm only spending 10% of my income on food, that leaves 90% for all the other things in life that I really enjoy, like getting to buy an iPad, getting to take my kids to a baseball game, getting to go to an Edmonton Oilers hockey game, although that might not be so good this time of year. <laughs> but, <laughs> but all those things you can now afford to do because meeting the, one of the basic necessities of life costs you so little. Now, one of the reasons that we can now uh, so readily afford food is because agriculture is so much more productive than it used to be. So here's going back over the past century, the yields for three major crops, corn, wheat, and soybeans. You can see corn, it's amazing. Uh, it's, uh, yields have increased over 500% over this century. Wheat and soybeans, about 200% over the same time period. What that means is we're getting more food using less land. Another way to look at that is, here's a graph from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. That, um, this, that uh, red line in the middle is an index of the amount of land in agriculture. There's less land in agriculture today than there was in the 1950s. Even though this little dotted blue line is the amount of food production, we have doubled the amount of food production while using less land. That is an absolutely incredible environmental benefit. Not only are we paying less for food, we're getting a whole lot more of it while still being able to preserve a lot of our natural resources and leaving some of that more environmentally sensitive land to other uses besides crop production. Um, of course, uh, one of the benefits of having a more abundant and accessible food supply is that we're living longer. So uh, back in the uh, 1900s, uh, men and women lived about 50 years. I don't know why you women seem to live a little longer than us uh, men, but we'll leave that aside. The main point is that both men and women over the last 100 years have increased our life expectancy by almost 30 years. Absolutely incredible. It's not all because of food. We have better med medical technologies. We have better uh, sanitation systems. Um, but one of the factors is the fact that we have a, a better, more nutritious food supply than we ever did. Food is safer. And if you look at the whole picture, here's a quote I took out of a USDA publication. They sort of summed it up by saying that there is no doubt that the food system delivers more nutritious food with wider variety, improved safety with less environmental impacts, and greater convenience set at any time in our nation's history. That was in a publication by the U.S. Department of Agriculture about 10 years ago. I think it would be politically incorrect for them to write that today, even though the statement is more true today than it was 10 years ago. So 
in wrapping up, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to do in giving talks like this is open the door for alternative ways of thinking about the future of food. And I think a potential danger that's embedded in the sort of worldview of naturalism is that it's a worldview that's inherently hostile to innovation and growth, even if that innovation and growth can improve food safety, environmental outcomes, make food less expensive. And I think it's important because how we think about our future affects who we become. You know, we tend to look at places like Athens and Rome and admire what they did, but certainly, rarely do we look at them as a model for who we want to be. There's an economist, Deidre McCloskey, she argues that one of the reasons we're so incredibly wealthy today is not necessarily because of the Industrial Revolution and capitalism per se, but because of a change in the way people begin to think about things like private property and trade and innovation. So what I'm trying to say here is that aspirations are more than wishes, we affect, they affect who we become. So I think it's important to think about our mindset with regard to the future of food. And I think we want a future of food, it, we want in thinking about a future of food, one that's open to innovation and growth. And so what worries me a little bit is having a, a generation of children that is unwilling or perhaps unable to use mathematics or chemistry or biology to think about how to improve our food system. I don't want a future where my kids are brooding over how to grow the oldest heirloom tomato, but rather one where they're thinking about how to use science and engineering to get corn to produce its own fertilizer or to get higher yielding, more nutritious staple crops in some of the most impoverished places in the world or maybe even to create space-age foods at the touch of a button. Now, those dreams may never materialize, but they are destined to fail if we create a culture in which they're never imagined. So I'm personally optimistic about the future of, of food. My optimism comes from uh, getting in front of groups like this, seeing young students that are interested in food and agriculture. My optimism also rests uh, with farmers and ranchers and food processors trying to make a buck by creating and selling us things that we don't yet know we even want. I say let's get out of their way. Thanks. So now you can throw some tomatoes, local or not, I guess. Thank you, Jason. That was, uh, that was great. Um, so now it's uh, the audience's turn. We have uh, Jody and Rihanna with mics, uh, portable mics. So if you have a question, uh, raise your hand and uh, one of them will try and get to you with a mic uh, so everyone can hear your question and then Jason will, uh, will answer them for you. Hey, just a quick question. Um, get you to comment on Alan Savory's work, the Savory Institute, mm -hmm. on high density rotational grazing for livestock. Yeah. Specifically I, in Oklahoma. In so. Oklahoma, yeah. Um, you know, if, if there's a range scientist uh, in the room, they're probably more suited to answer that question than I am. Um, it certainly is, is something that's captured a lot of attention. So, the basic idea, for those of you who may not know, as I understand it, is um, it's, it's an argument for a particular kind of, of a livestock production system that argues you can. Um, by heavy grazing on certain kinds of land, rotational grazing, you can improve the productivity of, of that kind of land. Is that a fair sort of characterization of, of, that, of that particular view? Yeah. So, so I think one of the important things is to, and I, I argue for this in the Food Police book, is to adopt a bit of humility about things you don't know. So I'm going to say I don't know a lot about that. What I have read about that leads me to be a little bit skeptical of a lot of those claims. One of the reasons is which a lot of the, those claims are not necessarily supported in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. Um, but I'm not going to claim that I know the answer to that. Uh, but certainly, we ought to try things out. We ought to experiment. We ought to try to innovate. Let's test it out. Let's see if it works. I'm all for that kind of uh, approach of, of trying new things out and seeing what works best. I just about forgot my question. I was listening to this. Uh, um, I'm familiar with savory, uh, mm -hmm. savory stuff. The idea is to is to mimic a natural system with the predators, who are the key. And there's lots of scientific proof of that. If you take the predators out of a system, 
the system falls apart. Mm -hmm. um, so two things. One of them that you haven't mentioned is if we had a, um, a vision of what we wanted rural life to be like, how does modern agriculture stack up there, mm -hmm. i.e. the towns are dying, the people are leaving the countryside, does that matter? Uh, the other one, your argument to me sounded a little bit black and white, and so your comparison of, you know, local, organic, was pictures of farms in the 40s. Nobody is suggesting we go back to that at all. The other one you mentioned, you know, if you go to the store and the apple with the worm in it, you must not have bought any organic food lately. I haven't seen a worm in an apple for a long time, <clears throat> organic or not. And so that argument to me is, uh, I've been on large, modern, organic farms that are just as efficient of producers and just as good of food, maybe more nutritious, mm -hmm. and more resistant or more resilient under drought. So, yeah, good, good questions. The, on the organic pesticide, or, organic producers, as you know, do use pesticides. So that, that's not a, a, an issue that's unique to organic versus conventional. Uh, in, in regard to productivity of organic, I just turn you to, to peer, you know, peer-reviewed scientific meta analyses in journals like uh, Nature and Science, which do show that there is a bit of a yield drag on average. Now, there's some studies that sort of uh, debate some of those things. You ask a really good question about rural life. Um, I, I have a view on that that's not very popular with some people, but I say this as somebody with some authority. I grew up in a town of 300 people. There were 12 people in my graduating class. And some people like to use statistics about you know, poverty or poor prospects in, in rural America and probably rural Canada. And one of the best solutions to that problem is a suitcase. But often there are a lot more alternatives, better alternatives in the city. And some people don't like to hear that, but that's just the truth. Um, and yeah, it's sad. The town I grew up in, there's even fewer people there now. The stores I used to visit are not there. You know, it's, it's a little sad. But I think to hang on to a, a way of life that isn't profitable um, isn't necessarily productive e either. And that's a view I know is not popular, even among my friends in the agricultural community. <laughs> so, you didn't uh, uh, approach the food industry's responsibility in the fact that our medical system is not sustainable because of diabetes, because of obesity and, and, and these things. So the, the food industry has a responsibility in, in addressing obesity and, and diabetes and the illnesses of value-added foods. So I'd like you to comment on that. Yeah, um, I don't see companies as responsible entities. I see people as responsible entities. And they're, you know, I'd, I'd be, lying to you, it'd be a, 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 to say there wasn't an issue uh, with obesity and diabetes. I think there is some progress being made there. Um, if you look at the rates of increase in obesity, they've really slowed down, so there hasn't been a, a statistically significant rise in the rates of obesity in the U.S. at least for probably a decade uh, among women. So it's starting to slow down, but that doesn't mean it's at a good level. It's still at a very high level, and some things like diabetes are still increasing. So really, a lot of what I'm arguing here in my book and elsewhere is, let's just make sure that whatever policy you want to advocate, that we have good research, that those actions are going to have the kind of consequences that we want. And I think a lot of what I see being advocated, that the research uh, that I see being done is going to suggest that they'll often impose a lot of costs, often costs on people that can least afford to pay it without really having any meaningful impact on those things like uh, obesity and diabetes. So I'm not necessarily... Uh, arguing that we shouldn't think about how to address those issues. I'm think, uh, what I am arguing is that we want to take a good strategy for thinking about those. We want to involve not just the nutritionist, but also the economist, and re recognize these are very complex problems, very multidimensional problems. With regard to the food industry, um, you know, food companies will sell whatever makes them money. And if we as consumers want healthier products, they will sell us healthier products. These are very low margin, highly competitive industries. And if they thought they could make a buck by selling us lower fat, as they did in the 1990s, they'll jump on that bandwagon. If they think they can do, sell gluten-free, walk in your grocery store now, they'll do it. So a food company 
can only respond to the demands that exist by the people in the public. Now, yes, they advertise. They try to convince us to buy things. A lot of that advertising is causing us to switch different brands, not always to eat more of their products. Um, but I don't, my particular perspective is that, that it isn't necessarily the case that food companies are the villain in all of this. Do they have some part to blame? Probably. But a lot of the you know, things that, that cause the rise in obesity are, are a lot of the things that we really enjoy. We have more leisurely jobs now. People are smoking less. Um, we have air-conditioned offices. We have less expensive food. All those things are good things in their own right, but they also have some adverse consequences. Like, I've got to work a little harder uh, to fit these pants than I once did. So life is full of trade-offs, and I think this is one of them. But, you know, I don't know the, the, the answer to that because I don't think there is the answer to that. Uh, several parts to my question. The first being that uh, the Canadian Digestive Health Foundation on their webpage states that 20 out of 35 Canadian, 35 million Canadians today have gastrointestinal diseases. That's pretty high. That means most of the people in this room have some issue. Um, maybe not all of those are uh, diagnosed either. So I think that says something about what's happening with our food, especially when they say that that number has doubled in the last 10 years. And GMOs have definitely increased in our processed foods. Um, I think the crops you're talking about primarily are corn, soy, sugar beet and canola, which if I never ate again, I would be fine. I would be healthy. So I'm, my question is, um, when it comes to farmers, in the last, um, I don't know, 10, 20 years, the royalty fees, the tech fees on these seeds have gone up, and I don't see any advantage to the consumer in these products. I see farmers who are paying more money what I do see is these corporations are gobbling up seed companies, they're patenting their seeds, they're making a lot of money, and I really don't see the advantage. I'm seeing, though, that a lot of the hybrids that are coming out do have a lot of advantages, and they're starting to outshine GMOs in a lot of areas like drought, resistant crops, and that kind of thing. So my question is, um, I'm trying to understand really what your point is here. I I'm not getting it. So several, several, you, you've wrapped up a whole lot there in a short amount of time, so I'll, I'll try to respond to each point. First, you're making a correlational analysis between the amount of GMOs that are planted and some dietary disease. We also have a whole lot more farmers markets today, too, but you're not going to argue that's also causing um, uh, the dietary disease. You can't just look at simple correlations because those don't tell us much. What you've got to do is take a particular trait, let's take Roundup Ready, and ask why would Roundup Ready soybeans or Roundup Ready corn cause a particular digestive issue. And I think the best research we have available to us, published in the best scientific journals we have available to us, suggests no cause for, for concern there. Now, you raised a point about consolidation in the seed industry. Um, I think that's a, fair, that's a fair criticism, and that's a debate one can have. It's a reasonable debate. The question, though, is, I think, with regard, yes, uh, Monsanto, DuPont, um, Bayer, they charge tech fees to their seeds. The question is whether farmers still want to buy their seeds despite the higher costs. And if you look at every major commodity organization, at least in the United States, they all advocate vehemently on behalf of access to biotechnology. Farmers want to plant BT corn, BT cotton, Roundup Ready canola. They want access to these technologies. Yes, they're having to pay higher prices for them, but their own revealed preference through the things they buy tells you what they want. Look at what the uh, American Farm Bureau Federation advocates on behalf of. They're an organization of farmers. Now your question is, is there any benefit to the consumer in all this? I think that's been one of the downsides of, you know, of the way that the technology has been developed is that most of the benefits, quite frankly, have accrued to folks on the farm. It, it, it saves them time. They can use uh, less, um, less pesticides. The herbicides they use, it's debatable whether they're using more or less herbicide, but I think one thing that's not debatable is that the herbicides they're using now are far less toxic than the herbicides they were using previously. Um, so what's the benefit to the consumer? Maybe there's a slight environmental benefit. There are slightly uh, fewer toxic pesticides, but, and maybe slightly small, lower prices, but those things aren't very transparent to people. And I, I think that's one reason for a lot of the aversion 
Um, but what I will say is that you can be pro-biotechnology without being pro-Monsanto. There are a lot of benefits to biotechnology. If you're a diabetic right now and you're taking insulin, that insulin came from biotechnology. The, uh, one of the latest uh, releases of a, a, disease, a drug to treat malaria is created through biotechnology. We can use biotechnology to help us in those things. It's just a tool. Um, it's a tool to help us, um, but with regard to you know, hybrid seeds or, or non-GMOs, my university, Oklahoma State University, sells uh, non-GMO wheat seeds with a patent that farmers cannot replant. This is not an issue that is unique to GMOs. So I think what you have to do, uh, people are conflating a whole host of issues with regard to one technology when it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's become the boogeyman for many things uh, that I think are actually a diverse mix of a, of a lot of issues. And no, by the way, I have not taken any money from Monsanto, nor have I ever been paid by Bayer or DuPont or any of these other companies, because that is the next question I always get. Uh, yes, uh, I'm normally a fairly uh, easygoing fellow, but you got my stomach churning. Maybe I should back uh, up a little bit. <laughs> I uh, milked my first cow when I was in 1937, and I milked my uh, cow last month. So I got a little perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, the cows I milked in 1937, they lasted more than two lactations. And now I have a neighbor who is sick two weeks after his neighbor sprays. Uh, <clears throat> I have, uh, <clears throat> have very few neighbors uh, in a six mile radius, I could count them on my one hand, that make their uh, living from farming. But I do have neighbors who are in CSA, mm -hmm. community shared agriculture, I have neighbors that are, are organic. There are people I like to visit. Uh, so I, there, there's, I, more, there's more to it than you didn't touch on that aspect. I agree. It, so I, I don't want to interrupt, but I, I do want to weigh in here because this, what you're saying relates to a comment you made about it doesn't have to be black and white. And I agree with that. Uh, we can have a diversity of, I, I don't mean to cut you off, uh, uh, but. I, I agree with the idea that we can have a diversity of food systems. Um, we can try different things. People that want different characteristics out of their food system and are willing to pay for it. Uh, it's, it's fantastic that we live in a kind of economy and country where people can do that. Um, and, and so, no, it doesn't have to be black and white. Um, and, and, and really what I'm trying to advocate for is if we're going to enact policies, though, that especially affect the price of food, we really want to think about those policies that affect not just my choice, but everybody's choices. And yeah, if we have pesticides that are causing some problems, I think there, are le there is legal recourse to be had there. And I have no problem when people are harmed resorting to those um, systems to, to seek redress for their, for their problems. so much for coming. Um, I'm a graduate student here and one of the things that uh, you said that really piqued my interest was you said you know our policies really have to be based on good research and one thing we all know about research is it follows the money and so I know in Canada as well as in the United States a lot of the research is funded by big corporations such as Coca-Cola and it silences a lot of um, research that should be coming out about the impacts of sugar and the impacts of some of these highly processed foods that we're consuming and so the research isn't able to be conducted because um, it's being redirected. And so how, how can we have policies that support the health of our population that's based on good research if the research isn't able to be funded? Mm -hmm. That's my question. Um, there's actually a, a lot of publicly available research on a lot of these topics. Um, you know, I work in an, an area where uh, there, you know, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has an initiative where they have a million dollars they give every year to work on research related to childhood obesity. That's not counting money from the NIH uh, or the NSF. So I, I don't think it's true that there's not publicly available research. Um, 
publicly available funding to be done on this research. Um, are, do food companies um, fund research to promote their self-interest? They do. Um, most good journals require conflicts of interest statements and disclosure statements. I think those are, are good things. Uh, you know, you want to evaluate all research, regardless of whether it's private or public, based on the merits of the research, but also knowing what the interests of, of the researchers were. Um, so I think that's true not only of the Coca-Colas of, of the world, but just because you're a nonprofit does not make you a non-interested party. And I think that's uh, we have to think about all competing interests that, that people have on, on both sides of that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in favor of doing research on that, but I, I, I don't think it's true that there is not good publicly available research, research dollars or that there's not research dollars available from various foundations that are out there. Now, as a researcher, I'm all in favor of more research dollars. So uh, if you want to advocate on behalf of that, I'm, you're not going to get any beef from me. Oh, sorry. The incredible cruelty with which animals are being uh, treated nowadays um, in uh, uh, agriculture, it, it's, it's just unconscionable. It is unnecessary. It is creating a holocaust for the animals. It has and continues to do so. It also is creating tremendous, tremendous problems with the environment. You put a few cows in a field and you get manure. You get compost for the ground. You put thousands of pigs, thousands of chickens, thousands of other animals in a barn, and you're going to get toxic waste. I urge everybody, please, to look into this more closely. Look at the effects on the environment. Look at the effects on the economy. Look at the effects on our health. And please try to watch conspiracy.com. Get it. Watch it. So I don't, I don't think that was a question, so I'll, I'll let it be. Check, check. I, I think that what you said earlier was about the conflation, uh, conflation of a whole bunch of issues all together. Um, I, just, I just came out of Africa, and I was working in Uganda and Kenya where black cicatoga and bacterial wilted are decimating bananas. Uh, brown streak mosaic is decimating cassava crops, and lethal necrosis is just wiping out the Kenyan crops right now. We have a very highbrow attitude towards science, and when I was over there talking to them about solutions with biotechnology, the poorest people in Africa have a negative opinion of, of the technology that really they have very little to spraying insecticides on to try to kill a virus that isn't going to be killed with insecticides. And one of the latest developments in North America is innate potatoes that will use lower fungicide rates to fight bacterial blight is lower in bruising and much lower in acrylamides when we cook them for french fries. This is a health food. It's a GMO food and it's being rejected based on policy or based on ideology. So my point is, how do we separate ideology from policy to make sure that politicians aren't passing panic policy separated from science? And I'm very concerned by that. Yeah, I mean, there's... There's, there's no easy answer to that question either. I mean, these are, these are all complex issues and there are, there are no silver bullets. Um, you know, I, th I think it is important for scientists to be involved in these debates. You know, you don't have to be involved in it in the way I am by making a, an aggressive case <laughs> sometimes, but at least representing your particular field of knowledge, I, I think is important. Um, you know, in the case of biotechnologies, I think what we want to do is evaluate the outcomes. Um, and you can imagine certain biotechnologies that, that could be dangerous or risky. Um, you can imagine conventional, conventionally bred crops that could be dangerous or risky too. So I, I think it's sort of, uh, again, we can use hammers to build houses or we can use hammers to hit people. You know, they're just a tool. We've got to look at how the tools are being used to know whether they're, they're productive or not. Um, one of the things I think you know, that, that needs to happen is some of what's happening now, in more engagement with the public. Uh, these, these, a lot of these crops were introduced without a lot of public awareness, without a lot of appreciation of the benefits, and it's not, it's not unreasonable that they might be a little worried about them, given that they didn't know anything about it, they couldn't see the benefits. Um, and then you, you layer that on top of a really a, a lack of understanding of the fact that, say, in corn, they've been using hybrids uh, you know, since the 30s or whatever, that a GMO is not a variety. You know, that it's, so there's, there's a whole complex of issues about not seeing the benefits, 
um, uh, having a technology uh, that, that probably, from the perspective of many people, seemed thrust upon them because they weren't aware of it. It's a whole complex set of issues. Um, and so I, I think you know, having some public discussion is important. I, I think, for me, the optimistic thing is, if I look at least in the states, um, we've had four ballot initiatives for mandatory labeling of genetically engineered food. Um, and California, Oregon, Colorado, and Washington State. In all of those uh, four locations, if you look at the polls done several months beforehand, they all suggested they were going to pass by a landslide. 80 plus percent of people said they'd vote in favor. By the time election day rolled around, they all failed by you know, very thin margins. But what that tells me is that people are willing to think about these issues. They're willing to change their mind. Yes, the biotech companies spent a lot of money advertising. So did the other side, not as much money, but some. But that does tell me people are open to persuasion. They don't know a lot about the technology. And I think that's, that's somewhat uh, optimistic. And I, and I think it's, it is important to separate some of these issues about market power, market access from the technology itself. They're related, but they're not the same issues. But I, you know, I don't, I don't have a, you know, a, a great example, a great answer to that question, other than I think it, it does take some public engagement, both by the companies and the scientists involved in some of the research, public engagement that hasn't been there at a level it probably should have been. So um, it, it seems to be that consumers are becoming a lot more conscious with uh, the food that they buy. Um, from a scientific perspective, what do you think is uh, the choice that consumers can make today to have the best impact at um, increasing the sustainability of uh, their purchasing decision? Yeah. I don't think I know what the, the best is um, and what's best, you know, given my own beliefs and values might very well be different than what you perceive to be the best. You know, the issue of sustainability is a complex one that involves a whole host of issues, some related to animal welfare, some related to environment, some related about the fairness of the food system, some related to the price you're paying for food, a whole mix of different issues, and how important one of those issues is to you relative to another is probably going to dictate uh, some of what's best for you. But, um, you know, so I, I'm not answering your question, but I'm, I'm, I'm not answering it in a way that I think is important. And that is, I'm not going to advocate on behalf, I'm not going to tell you should buy GMOs. I'm not saying that's what you should do either. Uh, what I am saying is I, I think it's good for people to have choice, and I think it's good for people to make those choices with the best available information. So, so Jason, I enjoyed your, ver your presentation very much. I thought you did an awesome job. And uh, you covered a lot of ground, okay? <laughs> Policy, environment, economics. Uh, but what I, what I wanted to say, you know, the slide that you showed about uh, death and pesticides caught my eye, okay? Only because with pesticides, I think we're not really worried about pesticides and our food causing death, but we are concerned about uh, the function of some specific compounds as endocrine disruptors. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the significance for health, that's not the one I would focus on, the death. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned cancer and you mentioned DDT. Mm -hmm. When I think of DDT, you know, my number one concern wouldn't be cancer, but rather the biomagnification in the food chain, the thinning of the eggshells, mm -hmm. everything that the environmental uh, Rachel impacts. Carson described mm -hmm. in 1962. Sure. So I think on that one, you have to be very careful. You showed the increase in, in corn production, 500% increase in yield. That's great. That's good news. Um, the amount of atrazine that's being used to generate that, that corn is something that I kind of have my eye on. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful American professor, Harvard educated at Berkeley, that published some beautiful papers on the change in the sex of frogs at levels of atrazine shown to be safe. Mm -hmm. He does his work at ultra low levels, at safe levels of atrazine, the, the, the sex ratio of the frogs change. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the frog testicles develop eggs. And he did remarkable studies. So one has to be a little bit careful and one has to consider also these other 
environmental aspects because a lot of our concerns come from that and not so much that. I, but I, the thing that yeah. really, and I just wanted to mention that as a comment, but the thing that I wanted, the point that I wanted to raise, mm -hmm. we're here talking about agriculture, which is great, and producing food, which is great. And on the farm, some things are generated which are consumed directly, like an apple, mm -hmm. okay? But if we go to a supermarket, once we start to talk about health of human beings, you know, if I look at your average Joe North American today, and I go into a supermarket, which I rarely do because there's almost nothing there I need, except for soap and toilet paper. But if I go in there, there's a lot of what I call edible industrial products that really have nothing to do with food anymore. So many North Americans have moved so far away from what I call real food. These are edible industrial products that you can eat and you will stay alive, but it's really not food anymore. So once you talk about food police, and I'm not saying anything about policy, I think we all have to make our own choices, but when we talk about food, what's in the supermarket, some of that has come from a farm, and some of it has been put together in a laboratory, and then it's gone to industrial scale. If you just look at the sodium contents at some of these things, you know, they've rendered some of these things inedible. So when we think about the health of North Americans, especially the obesity stuff and heart disease, uh, it'd be hard to link a connection to food that's coming from the farm because in between there was a factory doing a lot of processing. So that's, that's my comment and I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Um, so I want to say, I you know, some of the comments, I think the criticisms you have are, are fair criticisms you know, of trying to boil down a complex issue into a, a single number, but the, your criticism is fair. That on the atrazine point, um, two issues there that uh, I'm aware of the work you're, you're talking about by the Berkeley professor. There's a large-scale EPA study that was done after the fact, um, independently done, that doesn't seem to support those same kinds of effects. Um, and so, I, I, you know, it, it's a controversial topic. I don't think the science is, is quite as clear as it might seem. It's good people are doing research on it, though. Um, the atrazine issue, uh, we, we use less atrazine now. Why? Because we have BT corn. So this gets at the complex trade-offs that are, that are involved there. Um, if you don't like the BT corn, you're going to use more atrazine. Um, these are the sorts of difficult challenges, I think, that we face. But um, I, I, I agree with probably 75% of what you said. <laughs> um, my question is this. It's not so much uh, uh, concerned with, uh, let's say, uh, just what you said, but in general, um, uh, as a society, we, we fail to take account of consequences and especially, especially externalities. We have here in Alberta um, industry here where the coal industry, we don't really pay for the externality of coal and, and we have the tar sands now. Now I'm wondering about agriculture. Uh, in your talk, uh, you did not uh, indicate the need to take account of externality. I'm thinking of the... Uh, um, Mississippi, uh, uh, the mouth of Mississippi, as I understand it, there's a huge dead zone. Uh, Chesapeake Bay, there, there's some problems there. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering um, how, how as an agriculture economist, uh, you, you would want to address that problem. Can my row of agricultural economists help me out? No. <laughs> so um, I, think the way, I, I think the way to address that is on a policy by policy basis. So. You know, that's sort of why I went through the whole local foods thing, is, is that was an attempt to sort of ask, is this a, a, a policy prescription that's going to meaningfully deal with some of those externality issues? You already heard my answers to all those. Um, are there externalities in conventional agriculture? There are. And, um, are there externalities in, in organic agriculture? There are. Positive and negative. Um, I think the issue is, rather than getting wrapped up in the system, to ask what the externality is. Um, and I think the normal way an economist would think about this is to see what's the issue. If it's excess nitrogen, if it's excess carbon, we want to think about making sure we, we have a price on those that somewhat reflects the, the social cost, uh, whether it's a carbon tax, whether it's a, a, a pollution trading market, and then let the people engaged in the market figure out how to deal with that, with that price. So I'm, I'm not opposed to trying to think about ways of making sure we, we, we get the prices right. Um, so... 
Uh, but you're right, I, I didn't focus on that in, in, in my talk. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. And uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for now. Uh, we'll uh, move. There will be uh, some light refreshments served in the lobby, and Jason will have some copies of his book available for sale and for signing. So uh, let's thank Jason once more. And move on.